Adventures. Good morning, Adventures. I am in Denmark. I just got here from Iceland. I'm staying with a. Uh, I got a new friend with me. Here's my new friend. This is Carlo. Doing a little dog sitting here in Denmark. Where are you? He's moving too quick for the camera. And he's a little bit of a nutcase and he likes to pee on everything, but he's a dog, you know. And I am staying in this little cottage right here. A cottage in a village of 10 houses. So my bike is tucked up and I thought I would do I thought I would do a a quick video on Iceland because I know a lot of you are intrigued about how to get to Iceland, what it's like, how expensive it is, if there's any uh, any unique things that I didn't cover in other videos. So I'm going to go through that now. I thought I'd do a quick video. I thought I'd do a quick video on Iceland, not about you know physically riding around, but about getting there and about costs, expenses, things that you learn along the way, things that I didn't know before I got there and was shown by locals, that kind of thing. And then I'll show you like a big overview of um, of everywhere that I went and then uh, you can go back and watch the other videos. So um, I left, uh, my well, I should say my bike left uh, Portland, Maine and it was shipped in a container to Iceland. Um, shipped with a company called Imskip and it was a relatively easy process um, but in my case they literally employed lots of new people because of the pandemic and lots of new people didn't know exactly what was going on but I'll give you the simplified version. So the, the simplified version it's not uh, 20 seconds just so you know there's obviously it's a little bit involved because you are shipping your bike out of the country. In my case, I'm um, I'm riding around the world with this bike and the bike is gonna be out of the US for more than 12 months. So because of that, you need to get an EIN number. Um, you can do that online, it's quick, it's easy, it's instant, you get a number. Basically, it's the equivalent of your social security number for a business. So you become a sole proprietor and that is the Pro your proof of yourself and the bike put together for you to ship out of the country. And the reason for that is when you drop your bike off, um, you take your title and customs, US customs, customs will take your bike and they need to prove that it is, um, it's not stolen. So it, it actually does belong to you. And it takes about a week or so to do that. And then on your title, they stamp export. So this only applies if you're leaving the country with the bike and the bike is gonna be out of the country for 12 months. If it's not, then it's a lot simpler. Um, so you show up with your bike. Um, I'm Skip there in uh, Portland, Maine, not right on Main Street. And originally with me, they said the bike needed to be in a crate uh, because that was what was on the paperwork from years ago. So I ride with my bike in a crate. I'll show you photos. Um, but when I took it to the warehouse, the warehouse guy said to me, it doesn't need to be in the crate. And if I was you, I would take it out of the crate, uh, make your life easier on the other end. So just confirm that with them. Does it or doesn't it need to be in the crate? If it does need to be in the crate, I, because uh, the rules change all the time. I got a crate from a Triumph dealer. I uh, got it for free. If you want to make your own crate, then you're looking at something, uh, something in the region of about $300 just for the wood. So free crate made out of steel or a $300 wooden crate or no crate. So you need to find that out. So that's obviously an expense. When you go there, they will take your uh, copy of your title. They'll also take a copy of your passport, your driving license, or your registration. Um, driving license both sides and they will they're going to keep your title and they're going to keep it till the bike gets to Iceland they're going to give you um, a bill of loading bill of lading um, and that has all your make sure it has all your correct information on it and that's the reference for you when you get to the other end what you need to show the shipping company to be able to 
retrieve your bike. So when you, your bike is gone, it's shipped out. It takes approximately seven to 10 days in the US before it even ships, then it takes somewhere nine to 11 days to ship across. So you've got about a three week gap you need to fill. So in my case, I dropped the bike off in Portland uh, and then I went back to Phoenix and just waited for three weeks and then flew out. I was advised to get there approximately three to four days after the ship had arrived. They give you five days um, of free storage and then it has to be cleared on their end with their shipping company and then with customs. So when you get to the other end, my stacks of paperwork, um, you will get a declaration from customs in Iceland that says that you are legally allowed to ride your motorcycle on the road in Iceland as long as you have insurance. You need green card insurance, European green card insurance for Iceland and it needs to state on the insurance paperwork that Iceland is covered. If it doesn't, customs will not release your bike. Um, mine was written in Polish. Um, they didn't understand it. I ended up having to get somebody to translate it. Um, it was a complicated mess, but it took an extra day, uh, but I, I got it resolved. But if you can get paperwork and it shows clearly in English, it doesn't need to show in Icelandic, it shows in English that your bike uh, is insured for, for Europe, including Iceland, then the process will be very, very easy. And again, mine was more difficult because the lady that was doing the customs clearance was working from home and for whatever reason, she refused to answer the phone. Um, she would only respond via email, so everything took a lot longer. So your process after the pandemic should be a lot easier. Drop the bike in Portland, give them the documents, approximately three weeks, sales across, and uh, then you go to the other end, you pay, in my case, I paid the shipping fees in Iceland, and my total of shipping fees, I wrote this down so I get it exactly right, uh, my total for shipping was $1,067.52. So it's actually very reasonable. Um, and uh, like I say, then you get your clearance paperwork, and then you go and get your bike and then you're free to go and ride. So that's that's the process to get into Iceland. Now things, I've gone through a few different things that I thought I would tell you about riding in Iceland that you may or may not know. So first, money. Cash, physical cash, um, Icelandic crowns, they don't use them. Cash just is not a thing. Everything is done on a credit card and I will go in my pocket and I'll pull out my credit card and I'm going to show you. Um, I use US Bank. I have this, this card and it has the touchless and with this card, I don't get charged any transaction fees, any currency exchange fees or anything like that. If I didn't have this, traveling Iceland would have been an absolute nightmare because a lot of places, even though this is a credit card, they don't take credit cards. And if you have a debit card, then you need a pin number and your pin number needs to work in Europe. So there's a lot of little things that you need to work out. This, I use this every day, everywhere for everything, even buying a soda for about a dollar. This is what you use. Even kids that are seven or eight years old, they have cards, they don't have cash. So make sure you have a good functional card and your bank knows that you are going to Iceland and you are gonna be using it because it's gonna to be touchless virtually everywhere. You, uh, you're riding a motorcycle, so you need to put fuel in your motorcycle. And um, uh, the gas stations are not necessarily always open, but the gas pumps are open 24 hours a day. And as I've said, with the, with the card, with the credit card or the debit card, they don't always work. So I think the second time I went into a gas station, the lady in the gas station said, oh, what you need to do, make your life easy, get a gas card. So you buy a gas card, they have them in 1,000, 3,000, 5,000 and 10,000. So you have your gas card, you put it in, um, you just insert it into the machine 
you tap what uh, what pump you're on and then it pushes your card back out you go fill up and it just takes off your card what you pump that's it and um, you, you just buy these inside the store and it makes life a lot easier and especially if you need to fill up um, you know say a few of the gas stations I found were closed at six o'clock some were closed certain days of the week 24 hours a day you can get fuel so if you have these so this is a this is one of the very first things you might want to figure out and these blue cars these are for um, a gas station called N1 and N1 is uh, probably the the most common uh, gas station in Iceland there are quite a few there's like three or four different others um, and the, um, and they all do the same thing but N1 gas stations are pretty much everywhere um, so that's that's now you you have your bike there and you have fuel in it and you are riding around so the next thing most Icelandic people will talk to you about is the weather. The weather is a is a huge thing. So, is it sunny? Is it raining? Is it windy? Um, what's it going to be like? What they will tell you, and I got this off quite a few. I have a few friends in Iceland, a few different riding friends, and they all said the same thing: have a plan of what you want to see, but don't have a plan of when to see it. Let the weather decide your route around. And they have a weather app which is unbelievably accurate for about two days. And if it's sunshine in an area with something you want to go and see, go there because it might not be sunshine the rest of the time that you're there. So you use that, they said, like I said, about one to two days for accuracy. On that uh, app, it'll show you, on the screen, it'll show you the whole of Iceland, then you can click in certain areas if you want to zoom in a little bit, and it'll break it down about every two to four hours what the weather's gonna be like. And under the weather, the temperature, which obviously is gonna be in centigrade, it's gonna tell you a wind speed, and it's gonna tell you in meters per second. So make sure you understand what meters per second mean in relevance to if you know wind in miles per hour, because, um, a lot of Icelandic people will tell you, don't go out in strong winds because you could get blown off your bike. And my first day riding my KTM, I was blown off my bike. So I can actually acknowledge that that is a true fact. And I met another guy. Luckily, I was blown off my bike. I was just going around a corner and I was maybe doing five to 10 kilometers an hour. I met a guy who was blown off his bike and he was doing 60. Luckily enough, no damage to him or the bike, but it could have been a lot worse. So take a strong note on what the wind is and obviously a strong wind because you're so far north will create wind chill so if you're looking at the temperature take into account the temperature and what wind chill will be um, along with that rain um, Iceland is famous for its rain uh, if you look at most riders that go to Iceland they will ride probably more than 50% of their time in the rain. So make sure that your, your gear is 100% waterproof. Get the best gear you can, the most waterproof gear you can, and make sure that you can be warm when you're on the bike because with a wind chill, it gets, it gets cold. I, in one day's riding, I went from five degrees to 22 degrees back to six degrees. So that's a, over a 400% change in, in weather up and down. So be aware that fluctuations do happen and they happen a lot. Next, um, next, camping. Do you camp or do you go in hotels? So or hotels or say Airbnb. If you want to go that route, then uh, you probably look in anywhere from... $50 to $250 a night for a hotel depends if you're in a bigger city or you're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, if you're camping, the most I paid for a campground was approximately 20 US uh, dollars. The least I paid was about eight. Almost every campground is going to have toilet facilities, hot showers, cooking facilities, sometimes a restaurant, most of the time Wi Fi. Um, a, mm, probably more than 50% of the time uh, washing facilities. So if you want to wash your clothes. So camping is a very cheap way to go. And uh, campgrounds are everywhere. If you just go on to Google and put um, a 
I think I put GPX file of Icelandic campgrounds. It just generates a file, put it on the SD card and the uh, on the GPS, and I could see everywhere. And I, I usually within twenty to forty kilometers, there was a campground somewhere. Um, and it's honestly not worthwhile camping because of the facilities that you get and the low price for camping. Food. Um, Supermarkets, there is a massive difference between prices in supermarkets in Iceland. I mean, anything up to 100 to 200% difference on the same product. Um, probably the best supermarket to use is one called Bonus. It's, um, I put a photo of it up. It's the icon for it is a pig with a black eye. I didn't find out why, but that's what it is. And they have a lot of brands that you're going to be very, very familiar with. And they, uh, the prices are not dissimilar to what they are in most major cities in the US. So not too expensive, lots of produce, lots of things available, um, just for stuff that you're used to. And then uh, they are pretty common in the bigger towns and cities, um, out in the middle of nowhere. If you're heading to the middle of nowhere, just make sure you have enough supplies because if you don't have your own food to cook, then um, you're going to buy food. And if you're going to buy food at restaurants, it's expect to pay probably in the region of $20 for, um, say you wanted a hamburger, fries and a Coke. That's going to be around $20. So that's probably about double what you might be used to in the States or, or close to double. Um, fast food joints, um, the gas stations are the fast food, food joints. And don't discredit the um the the gas station food because it is actually really good it's surprisingly really really good and they have a very good selection um and it does vary in price a lot bigger cities more expensive smaller places more reasonable prices similar to what you're used to um restaurants expect probably two to three hundred percent more than what you would expect to pay for a similar a similar meal similar drink in the u.s so I covered getting here, getting here from the US, it might be an option um, for you as a gateway to Europe or a gateway out of Europe. Um, if you're gonna come here like I did, I left on the ferry, uh, but there is another option. You can ship your bike from Reykjavik. There's a company called Samskip that ships to Rotterdam, uh, but obviously you need to be aware that you have to fly, the bike goes on the container ship, you need to get to, um, you need to get to the container port to get you get your bike. You need somewhere to stay, either end your flight. Um, it works out from the people that I spoke to. It works out reasonably close in price um, if you have the time. So a lot of Icelandic riders, when they ride Europe, that's what they do. Um, the ferry cost um, for the ferry two dinners and one breakfast um it was right around 900 dollars, about 760 euros so that's a thing you need to take into account so get into iceland 1060 getting off iceland around 900 so take that into account but think about from north america to iceland you might think air canada it's a better way to go air canada doesn't come to iceland so you would go to mainland europe there can be additional fees when you, I, I've done that, that trip myself, there can be additional fees when you get to the other end in Europe. So take that into account. It's gonna cost you somewhere between a thousand and $1,500 for the bike and you to get to Europe. Then if you want to go to Iceland, uh, like I say, about $900. So you're about the same, but now you're in Iceland and you need to get away from Iceland. So there's, you know, ballpark again, about another thousand dollars. So it's, it is a very cheap option as a gateway to Europe or a gateway out of Europe that a lot of people don't consider. And the riding of course is absolutely awesome. Um, so to follow on to that, the riding, um, I got on, the, I didn't see more than two or three other bikes the whole time I was there. Um, I'm on a KTM 500 EXC. I'm on little back roads, dirt roads, tracks, goat trails, whatever. Um, when I got to the ferry, there was about 40 or so bikes and all but, all but four of them, I think, four, maybe five of them were BMW GS. 
And virtually every single one of those guys came up to me and they said, you brought the right bike, we brought the wrong bike. The reason is they had to spend most of the time on the ring road going around the outside. Um, and they found the, the conditions, the river crossings, the how the ground feels, very soft volcanic sand that their bike generally they weren't comfortable riding um, too much off-road into very remote areas. So take take your bike into consideration. Uh, if you prefer to spend the majority of your time on paved roads, that's great. Uh, but be aware with Iceland, you will miss a lot, a lot of really good stuff because it's on dirt roads. If you ride like I do on dirt roads and on a dirt bike, um, don't discredit the paved roads because again you'll miss a lot because Iceland their road system is set up a lot for tourists and it's set up for people to drive two-wheel drive cars to see certain things and four-wheel drive cars to see other things so if you if you are a rider that's capable to go on road and off road you'll get the both best the best of both worlds which is what I did so um, just take that into account. Be aware that um, you can see great stuff on and off road, uh, but you can't see all of it just riding one particular surface. Riding on a daily basis. Um, what I found, and I spoke to a few local riders and they tended to agree, um, I didn't generally, I didn't start my day until usually after say 10.30, 11 o'clock, sometimes 12 o'clock. Um, and I would ride till about eight o'clock at night. The weather in the morning seemed, always seemed worse and it gradually got better through the day. I was exceptionally lucky, exceptionally lucky. Um, in almost a month riding in Iceland, I, probably didn't ride in the rain for a total of the whole time for more than two hours. Um, I, my longest stint in the rain was maybe 40 minutes. That is rare. <laughs> I mean, even even the Icelandic riders that I met, um, the friends that I stayed with, they they were kind of laughing. They're just It's almost impossible to, to spend that much time in Iceland and not get wet. So like I said earlier, make sure your gear works. Um, I was wearing Gore-Tex gear, um, didn't really need it. Um, I was wearing uh, seal skin uh, socks to keep my feet dry for the river crossings. I probably did river crossings, water crossings, I probably did 60 or 70. Um, so be comfortable doing that. If you're going to go off road, you will encounter water crossings. Most of them are not more than axle deep. And most of them, you can actually see the bottom. You can see what you're getting yourself into. So again, not too bad. So my total riding came out to about 5,300 kilometers. And uh, for just less than a month, like 20, about, I think it was about 25 days total um, riding. And my total expenses for the whole time here, not including the 1,060 for the shipping, my total expenses for my whole time here came out to, I'm just checking the number, $1,222. And that comes out about $53 a day, average about $53 a day. That's for everything. That's for somewhere to sleep, something to eat, fuel, um, did an oil change um, because my bike needs oil changes on a regular basis. Um, and every, every expense um, that included um, a ferry in the West Fjords that was about $75. Um, and I still only averaged around, uh, around 50, what did I say, $53 a day, which Iceland is renowned for being a very, very expensive country. And I was planning on something in the region of, a, of $100 a day. And I came in at half of that. So one of the main reasons for that is the exceptionally cheap and good quality campgrounds. So use those if you can, and you can make it affordable. When I was riding along one day, I was thinking about the riders that do the, the TAP, the Trans-America Trail. And if you go coast to coast in the US, um, and then 
you have to ship your bike back, which whichever you either ship your bike to the start or you ship your bike from the end back to the East Coast, for example. And on a Facebook page, it comes up a lot. How much does it cost? Um, and a lot of riders were saying, oh, it's expect to spend somewhere between $2,500 and $4,000 for total expenses. Okay, good. Now think about what I just did. I spent, if I ship my bike to Iceland, rode for almost a month, about the equivalent of what most people take on, on the tat. And then if I ship my bike straight back to the States, I would have been at um, around, around $3,300. So ride in Iceland for about, about three, three weeks or so, um, is about the same price as riding the Trans-America Trail. Didn't expect that, did you? So to finish up, where did I go? I started Reykjavik, because that's where the shipping port is. And when I got there, I have some friends that live here, and I had a couple of friends give me bikes, and I did a couple of, a couple of loops. So I did about 200, 250 kilometers on other people's bikes. Then when I left... I was checking the weather and was I going to go this way, this way, this way. And so I looked at the weather app and this area here looked like it was going to be the best weather um, for about a week or so. From about here across, it was just total rain for about a week. So I gambled, even though the weather app, they say only use maybe two days for accuracy. I headed out of Reykjavik and I did a couple of loops and then came to here to get a ferry up to the West Fjords, but I got here early. So I did a figure eight loop around here. And this was the most rain I had the whole time I was in Iceland was about 45 minutes, just riding this part of that loop. I took the ferry, it was about three hours across. It stops at a little island. Um, don't get off at that island um, if unless you want to be there for a whole day. They said if you took your motorcycle off there, you could ride the whole island in about four minutes. So keep that in mind. So get to the West Fjords and I kind of zigzagged all over the place. And I was up here for about a week riding around backwards and forwards. And there's some awesome riding. I mean, if you look at the previous videos, you can you can see I think one through probably one through three are in this area here. Then from there, I came back down and made my way east and I received an invite to with a friend from Akiri. So I went to Akiri and I stayed there and him and I then did a loop, this loop here and back to Akiri. And then at that point, the weather looked good. The first day I was there and I was gonna head this way. Two days later, the weather completely changed, 100% changed from warm sunny to torrential rain and strong wind so i changed my route and i came back and i came down through the middle of the country on the f-35 and went back into Reykjavik to see some more friends and then from there headed along the south coast and down here is where a lot of the waterfalls are the glaciers are a lot of the volcanoes there's lines of volcanoes and incredibly awesome even though this is mostly pavement through here it's still incredible scenery round to this side and i got to around here and again the weather was looking like it was going to change it was going to change and go bad in this area so what i did i changed and i went inland and i did some loops inland and then came back this way um one of the things I wanted to see, because they're 60% of the world's population is puffins. I mean, there's waterfalls, thousands of them, they're everywhere. But puffins are pretty rare and, and not always easy to see. Originally, I wanted to see them over here. The fog was so thick, you couldn't even see two meters. I wanted to see them over here, uh, but you had to book a tour and they were fully booked for three days. And I didn't want to sit and wait for three days to go on a tour. And then up here, you can actually go right to the end of the road and you can, they're less than a meter away from you. Um, so that was, that was great. Um, if I was picking favorite parts of the island, it would be up in here, West Fjords, which is absolutely incredible. This road down here and anywhere in this area um, is very, very remote, but very spectacular. Um, this area for the waterfalls, 
and then one particular road right up here um, was the uh, I believe it was the 917 um, the views off the top of the mountain were just incredible absolutely incredible and then on the very last day I stayed I went down this fjord to a place called Breca and stayed in a place called Solbreca, which is right near the end. It's one of the most eastern um, eastern places you can stay in Iceland. And that fjord is very rarely ridden, I'm told, but it was incredible, absolutely incredible. But it left on the last day about a two hour ride to get to the ferry. So, so that was my total trip around 5,350 kilometers total with my bike and a couple of friends bikes and just unbelievable um, if Iceland is on your um, if Iceland is on your your bucket list um, do it just just do it they are starting to pave more and more of the road so if you want an off-road adventure you have to go a little bit further now to find it so uh, but if Iceland is, is a dream ride for you, it's very affordable. Um, it's very easy to get there. And hopefully this, this video helps and some of you will, will go enjoy the island.